There's an island in northwestern Europe that has become the home of Formula One over the last 70 odd years, and it's also become an integral part of other forms of motorsport because of exporting different bits and pieces like components and stuff like that. And over the last sort of seven or eight years, I've developed a genuine interest as to why this has been the case, because there are other countries that should be able to do it better. You read it all the time on social media. Formula One is too Britain-centric. The commentators are from Britain, the teams are mostly based here, the engineers are mostly based here and all were born here, and there's a phrase that gets repeated time and time and time again, even when the stuff being talked about is pretty balanced. British bias. If I had a pound for every time I read that online, I'd never work again. But like I said, it's a genuine interest for me. Why here? Because in 2013, Jeremy Clarkson on Top Gear had the same question, in a way. Because if there's one thing we are told quite often, it's that we don't make anything anymore. The car industry is dead. Everything else was sold overseas and is now made overseas because it's cheaper and stuff like that. But we build way more than we think, and that segment was probably one of the best things they ever did. At least when it came to doing the super serious stuff as opposed to the challenges. Actually, while we're here, what was your favourite Top Gear challenge or special? And why was it the ambulances? This is a video I did like six or seven years ago, but I wanted to revisit it. And it was part of my short-lived podcast called That Racing History Podcast. But I wanted to do things properly this time. Look at the different things that were happening in Britain around the time Formula One started in terms of World Championship and how things evolved. Instead of just making it, you know, Britain is better than you. When it comes to motorsport... I mean, we are pretty good. It's probably the only thing that we're good at because we're not good at football, we're not good at rugby and only Australians think that cricket is a real sport. So this all starts after World War II. A lot of engineers and pilots suddenly found themselves out of work and needed something to do in this new post-war world. During the war, the RAF had to build many more air bases because of all the aircraft that were being built and a lot of these airfields after the war got repurposed for storage, industrial units or whatever they needed to be used for. Five of those air bases were located in Norfolk, Northamptonshire, Hampshire, North Yorkshire and West Sussex. The RAF bases of Snetterton Heath, Silverstone, Thruxton, Croft and West Hampnet, the latter being more commonly known as Goodwood. These airfields, among others, were converted into racetracks because the perimeter roads and the runways and the taxiways could be easily configured for doing different things. Goodwood and Silverstone in the early years used just the perimeter roads. Goodwood still uses the perimeter roads as does Thruxton. And you can do other bits and pieces for straight line testing and stuff like that. So the mechanics and engineers that built the aircraft moved into cars and the pilots that were out of a job after the war and still looking for that adrenaline buzz drove them. And when the Formula One World Championship became a thing, it was pretty much the manufacturers. Maserati, Ferrari, Alfa Romeo, Talbot, or is it Tolbo, but there were a couple of lesser known British manufacturers on the grid, such as ERA and Alta. In the early years of the World Championship, it was Alfa Romeo, Ferrari and Maserati that were dominant. And yes, you had Mercedes, but they withdrew following the horrendous Le Mans disaster of 1955. But as time went on, things started to change a little bit. Cooper, Lotus and BRM were three upstart companies that joined the grid through the latter part of the 1950s. And when they joined the grid, they didn't have the deep pockets that the Italians had, so they had to resort to playing smart instead of throwing money at things. Cooper, for instance, started sticking the engines in the back of the car as opposed to all the other teams that were sticking them in the front, and this improved the handling of the cars no end. BRM was a team that had shown up a few times on the Formula 1 grid, based in Bourne in Lincolnshire, a town I know a little from going swimming there as a kid. Raymond Mays, who formed the company, operated it out of his family home on Spalding Road, and Mays had, prior to starting BRM, been part of the ERA company building hill climb and road racing cars. So when he set up BRM, a lot of the engineers from ERA came over. The ERA factory, as it so happens, wasn't too far away from that house on the Spalding Road, and they also had access to a nearby airfield that they could use for straight line testing. So by the end of the 1950s, the F1 world map looked something like this. You've got all the Italian teams pretty much clumped together in northern Italy, with the British teams starting to make their way into the sport, building these lightweight, small and cheap sports cars that were more often than not sold to privateers looking for a way in. The likes of Cooper and Lotus would be doing this quite often, and it's how they made their money. But by 1965, there was a bit of change in the air. Pretty much all the Italian manufacturers had disappeared, leaving just Ferrari. In turn, Brabham had joined the grid, as had Honda, and don't be confused by the pin for Honda being there in Amsterdam, because that's where they were based in 1965. They were based in Tokyo for 1964 when they joined Formula One, but then moved to Europe the following year. 
Later on, towards the end of their original run in Formula 1, they'd moved to Slough, just to the west of London. Saying that, you had Lola building sports cars in Slough too. But there's also something else to consider here. In a few cases, you've got companies set up by people who worked for existing companies already in Formula 1. Brabham, for instance. Jack had been working for Cooper and set up motor racing developments because he knew the Coopers he was driving could be better and Cooper was rather resistant to change. There were other things that MRD did as well, like do upgrade kits for road legal cars, producing, at one point, a Triumph Herald with a Coventry Climax engine in it. A similar thing had happened with Lotus. Mike Coston and Keith Duckworth left Lotus to start their own engineering company, with Duckworth leaving in 1958 and Coston following in 1962. Maintaining a relationship with Chapman, Cosworth made money by doing engine work for the Formula One team and for the road car division, before Chapman convinced the Ford Motor Company to fund the development of Cosworth's crown jewel, the DFV. Not only were these people breaking off and forming their own companies, they were taking some of the brains with them to start these companies, and the people that were actually involved in breaking away in the first place happened to have something about them that made them quite successful. There was a lot of innovation going on at that time, and a lot of the people involved in setting up these new companies were quite entrepreneurial. Yes, I got that in on the first take. I hate that word. Well, saying that word anyway. Brabham and Turanak and Coston and Duckworth weren't the only ones because by the early 1970s there had been other partnerships involved in the sport. March, set up by Max Mosley, Alan Rees, Graham Coker and Robin Hurd, Bruce McLaren's team that continued to operate after his death at Goodwood in 1970, and Tyrrell had now joined the sport after being the guy who ran Matra's operation for a couple of years. So what's that done for the map then? Well, we've lost a couple of teams, notably Cooper that went bust around the end of the 1950s, but this fabled motorsport valley we hear so much about hasn't really formed yet. Yes, there's still Ferrari in Italy doing Ferrari things, but as you might have noticed, most of the companies in Formula 1 in Britain around this time are based closer to London than anywhere else. Lotus is still there in Norfolk, BRM barely hanging on in Lincolnshire, but McLaren, Brabham, Tyrrell, later Surtees and Graham Hill Racing by the mid part of the 70s all based within a short drive of Heathrow Airport. Some of you are probably shouting at your screens right now trying to tell me that McLaren is based in Woking and not in Colnebrook. It is now, but not back in 1971. I've also put Dan Gurney's All-American Racers team or the Anglo-American Racers team on the map as well, despite not being in Formula 1 at this point, just as a reference for you. Also, around this time, the motorway network was being constructed. The Preston Bypass, today part of the M6, was the first motorway built in Britain, with the first interurban motorway, the M1, constructed between 1968 and the mid to late 1970s. The M40 was opened in 1967, with additions to that opening up in the 70s, and then the section that ends just south of Birmingham opened in 1983. With motorways providing a more economic way of getting around, the teams didn't need to be in the south of England anymore, and they started moving themselves a little further north instead. By being to the north of London, it was going to be easier to get to Silverstone for testing. And with Silverstone being almost bang in the middle between Birmingham and London, it made a lot of sense for the teams to start moving that way north, because you had the motorway network, you had the rail lines, you had East Midlands Airport, Basically, everything was starting to migrate that way anyway in terms of industry and other bits and pieces that were being set up. So by being closer to Silverstone and then being in between Birmingham and London, it was just so much easier to get around. There had been a tiny shift just before that though. In 1976, Franco Ambrosio, Alan Rees of March, Jackie Oliver, Dave Wass and Tony Southgate left Shadow to start their own team, Arrows. Shadow had been based in Northampton, but Arrow set up shop in Milton Keynes, a city that was built deliberately to be equidistant from Birmingham, Leicester, Oxford and Cambridge, but also has a direct route down towards London. And the rise of these privateers from the 60s into the 70s being all sustainable for a time, versus the ones we saw come out of Italy in the late 80s for instance, was a mix of a few things. Number one is that some of them were splinter teams from existing operations or companies, like we've already established, Brabham, Cosworth, Arrows and teams like that, leaving to do their own thing or leaving because the people they were leaving were just sinking ships and they took the best guys with them. Or they were able to recruit because of something else. The British aviation industry completely collapsed from the end of the war into the early 1960s. It wasn't an instant thing, but a gradual thing. The end of the war obviously had something to do with it, and Britain did produce planes after the war, such as the three V-bombers in Valiant, Victor and Vulcan, the de Havilland Comet, the Blackburn Buccaneer, and so on. But those were pretty much kept inside Britain. The Comet was outdone by the Boeing 707. 
the Americans had the market sewn up on exports by the end of the 60s because they were selling to domestic carriers and international carriers, while the British and French were keeping things internal. The BAC 111 and the Vickers Viscount did get sales abroad, but it really wasn't enough, and Rolls-Royce almost collapsed as part of the Lockheed TriStar project. Unlike the US or the Soviets, Britain had to export stuff, and the designs of some of these aircraft were for things like intercepting Russian bombers over the North Sea, something that wasn't needed in, well, the Middle East. The MiG-15 was used by the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union's allies and the Eastern Bloc countries, so there were loads of them. The F-4 Phantom, built in the thousands and exported all across the world. The English Electric Lightning, they built less than 350 of them. So as these aircraft companies collapsed, the engineers, the aerodynamicists and all those people started going to motorsport based teams and they started working there. So it turned Formula One from a niche rich boy sport into a multi-billion pound industry. Seven of the ten teams are now located in what has become known as Motorsport Valley, a region that sits between Birmingham and London that has rough borders with the M40 and the M1, although they're not exactly hard borders, they're just a guideline. The only F1 team in Britain that sits to the south of London is McLaren in Woking, but all the others, including Haas, are in that corridor, all within an hour's drive of Silverstone. Between 1970 and 1992, the team slowly moved into the area and formed a hub of industry that has now become similar to Silicon Valley in California, where a lot of the tech companies are based. So it makes you wonder then what the map looks like when you factor in all of the teams who had bases in that region either at the end of their time in Formula 1 or now. It's actually been pretty hard to cram it all into the map with many of the teams having moved in from elsewhere, but a lot of them have shared the same town from time to time and teams staying in facilities when they change owners simply because it's easier for them. East Midlands Airport nearby, the main motorway network is there, it's just easier. But some of you might be thinking, well, what about Germany? The Germans build good cars, the Germans are masters of engineering, efficiency and all those stereotypes. But when you actually think about it, it does make sense. The reason for Germany not being the centre of motorsport after the war is because of how fractured the place was at the end of it. Remember, when the war ended, Germany was divided in two. West Germany, a capitalist economy, and East Germany, a communist one. Then you've got Berlin, also split in two. The west side looked after by the British, the French and the Americans for the time, and then the east under Soviet control. Also following the Second World War came the Cold War, where we saw rapid advancements in weapons, aircraft and space technology, and the rockets developed by the Germans during the war were then tweaked and refined to build things like intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the rockets that sent the first men and animals into space, and the probes that were sent out to the far-flung reaches of the solar system too. In Britain, the engineers went from aviation to racing. The aviation industry was falling apart thanks to some bad decisions in government and other stuff, and we had no space program. In Germany, the top engineers were poached by each side's respective aerospace weapons and space programs or moved elsewhere, and there wasn't much left over for racing after that. As such, the British motorsport economy is massive. In 2013, it was estimated that there were 3,500 companies just within Motorsport Valley, employing around 40,000 people, and that includes the F1 teams, who have anywhere between 700 and 1,000 people working for them. At the time, that was 80% of the world's high-performance engineers, located in that area between Birmingham and London. Over half of the revenue generated in 2013 in Motorsport Valley was exports, which accounts for about £3.5 billion. 30% of the total £6 billion revenue raised in Motorsport Valley was then put back into research and development, which is considerably higher than anything in the medical field. And because of the teams now being pretty much entrenched in that small area, and all the people that work for them in the same area, it's easier for those people that work there too. If somebody is going to be moving from Mercedes to Red Bull, chances are they won't have to move house. The kids won't have to move school, the missus won't have to find a new job, or the boyfriend won't have to find a new job, or whatever. But if you're moving from Mercedes to Ferrari, or Sauber slash Audi, you've got to move house. You've got to move all of the stuff. The kids need to go to a new school where they don't speak the language and won't have any friends. The partners need a new job where they might not speak the language, and so on. It's going to be a nightmare. So what happens is the talent stays in one place as opposed to being spread out across the whole of the F1 entry list. And I looked at this briefly when I talked about Jonathan Wheatley going to Audi and how that might entice one or two British engineers to move over with him. But who knows? What's the point in upping sticks and taking everything with you and making the wife and kids potentially miserable when you can stay here where only the weather is miserable?
In turn, Ferrari will get pick of the Italian and Continental engineers because it's Ferrari, while the likes of Toro Rosso or whatever they're called now and Sauber won't be able to get people as good. So the gaps increase. In theory, anyway, because Toro Rosso has the Red Bull connection, which helps them. Since the Constructors' Championship was established in 1958, there have been 17 occasions where a car not built in Britain has won the World Championship. 16 of those occasions are Ferrari, the 17th being Matra when they won in 1969. So it's utterly mental to think then that since 2009, every single one of the Constructors' Championship winning cars was built here, an island just smaller than the state of Michigan. How have we managed to do that? It's probably just British bias, to be honest. So then, an updated look at how Britain became the home of Formula One and how motorsport value was created, and why it's here and not Germany that's the home of all things F1. If this has been interesting for you, then do like the video so I know it's been interesting and that you enjoyed it, and if you want more from the channel, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk over at Patreon that continue to support me at a more personal level. And if you want to help keep things running around here, a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates, and other bits and bobs you might want or need to know. Or the super thanks if you just want to buy me a coffee, or memberships if you want a Patreon alternative. So until next time, I've been Ada Millward. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.